This is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today it's October 15, 2017, and I'm interviewing Kenneth Johnson for the Oklahoma Native Artists Project on behalf of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're in Santa Fe, New Mexico at Kenneth's studio. Kenneth, you're Muscogee Creek, a contemporary jeweler who's known for their innovative, often customized designs with southeastern influence. Um, you've won numerous top awards at shows across the country, the Heard Museum, Santa Fe Indian Market, and two Supreme Court justices have your jewelry. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Sure thing, Julie. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Lubbock, Texas, of all places, and I grew up in Oklahoma. My mother moved back to Oklahoma City when I was four years old, and I uh, spent time with my family in Tulsa in the summertime popping firecrackers and uh, going down to the river in Tahlequah. Our family have been gathering in Tahlequah since the 1890s. Uh, yeah, so my, uh, you know, my time in Oklahoma was uh, mostly on the eastern side and moving back there let me connect as opposed to having to grow up in Lubbock. That would have been tough. <laughs> right, right. What did your folks do for a living? Well, I only grew up with my mother, and so I didn't meet my father until I was older. And my mother, uh, she just worked at a hospital, and I wasn't very aware of her career. But uh, what I was aware of is I went to a place called Seneca Indian School as a child. And the Seneca Indian School is a boarding school in northeastern Oklahoma in Wyandotte. And my mom had gone there in the uh, 40s, 50s. Uh, my uncles had both gone there in, in the uh, uh, earlier than that. And uh, even my oldest aunt went there. So we had a little family history there. It's a family there. tradition. And the thing about Seneca Indian School is it was a, a really good place for my mother to go to because she was being raised by her grandmother. And that was in a farm life, and uh, it was difficult for my grandmother to uh, make ends meet. And Indian school was a good place uh, for her. And, you know, she had a uh, place to uh, grow up and learn and be around other kids. And, and so there I was when I was six years old. My mom said, uh, would you like to go to Seneca Indian School? You'll have other little kids to play with. And... Uh, what my mother didn't know is that in between the time she was there as a little girl and when she was going to send me, it had kind of turned into a reform type school, a place of last resort for kids, you know, for foster care or juvenile uh, uh, court system. And uh, so it was kind of a rougher experience, but I loved it. And uh, one of the things that I learned at Seneca Indian School was arts and crafts. And that's where I started working with my hands. A lot of macrame, a lot of beadwork, a lot of, uh, you know, things to keep kids busy mm -hmm. when we weren't running around in the woods. Mm -hmm. You know, the formal education was, you know, nothing that I remember, but uh, the other types of education were important, I feel like, and helped me through, you know, later parts of life. Definitely. Now, did you have any brothers or sisters? I have uh, half brothers and half sisters. Yeah. And how about your maternal grandparents? Did you have a relationship with? Yes, my uh, I was close to my grandmother, and uh, her name was Lucinda Walking Stick Bruner. She's a okay. Bruner, and uh, the, part, the thing about our family, you introduced me as uh, Creek, Muscogee mm -hmm. Creek, and I'm also Seminole. Okay. So, uh, Creek and Seminole are both Muscogee, Muscogee people. Well, there's a little bit of a difference. Yes, I, f I forgot to add the Seminole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, growing up uh, in spending time, my mother made her point to take me back to Tulsa. And, you know, getting to spend time with my cousins. It gave me a sense of identity of where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And then as I grew older, I started understanding... Uh, how my family ended up in Tulsa. And I, I'd always ask my grandma questions. I was just always grilling her. She'd she a little frustrated with my questions sometimes because I was pesky. 
but I like researching things. I like understanding the path of how things happen. And uh, my grandmother had two husbands. Her first husband was Seminole. And uh, his name was Newman Johnson. And uh, our family was originally from around Wewoka. Mm -hmm. And so that's on the border of the Seminole and Creek uh, countries. And so uh, she had four children uh, with him. And actually five, one, one didn't make it, but um, then she, uh, uh, they divorced and then she married a Cherokee man and she had four children with him. And so she went from being a Johnson to being a walking stick. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people assume that I'm Cherokee because my grandmother is a walking stick. But uh, that's, that's the history behind that's that. That's the history. Yeah, so that. half my family is Creek and Seminole. The other half of my family is Creek and Cherokee. Mm -hmm. That's why you're rendezvous in Tahlequah. That's why it was Tahlequah, yeah. <laughs> um, so what is your first memory of seeing Native art? Your very first memory. I think, you know, we were... I would watch my uncle, John Walkenstick, he painted a lot, and he, uh, he did a lot of arts and crafts. Uh, there were family members who would just, you know, they paint on rocks, and mm -hmm. they were doing beadwork and that type of thing, and um, actually getting to engage with artwork. Uh, as a child, we watched uh, the career of Enoch Kelly Haney, and his, his time spent with us Indian kids you know, as an artist, I think he would just go and speak, and it, it impressed us, our, us little kids in Indian school. He was at Seneca. Uh-huh. He, uh, well, he actually spoke at Sequoia High School, is when okay. I remember him. And a group of uh, the younger children from grade school at Seneca Indian School went to Sequoia High School. Once a year, Sequoia High School would uh, be the gathering spot for all the boarding schools in Oklahoma. To have an arts and crafts uh, and a kind of a, I don't know what, what it was, uh, but all the other boarding schools would gather at, at Sequoia. And Kelly Haney was there giving a presentation in one of the classrooms. And I, I like to tell the story that when Kelly was at the front of the class, he drew a, a circle on a chalkboard. And he says, what's this? And he said, uh, circle, zero, uh, letter O, you know. And, you know, this chalkboard was the place we had only ever seen text or numbers. And for this Indian man to get up there, and he proceeded to add more lines and say, what's this? And we guess, and he, he ended up drawing the most uh, incredible Indian face, you know. And we were amazed to watch art happen, you know, on this thing we'd only ever seen text and numbers on. And it gave us a different perspective. And then we followed his career, and he put all these, uh, you know, uh, postcards out that would have imagery like a feather with faces in it, or a, a warrior that showed, uh, you know, the modern warrior and a, an ancient warrior. And we we liked that. We liked that nuance, and uh, it was really cool to follow him. And that was our one of our engagements with Indian art, besides the crafts that we were making mm -hmm. to keep us out of trouble, keep mm -hmm. our hands busy, right? And it was very gratifying to get to know Kelly as an adult and also as an artist. And I'm currently in a collaborative work with him uh, on, a, on our canoe project. He's making a really cool paddle. Anyways, uh, right. engaging with Indian art, you know, that was, uh, that was my early memories. It's John Walkenstick, Kelly Haney. Mm -hmm. So what is your very first memory of making art? Tough question, I can't remember it that far back. Uh, I enjoyed making art at Seneca Indian School. I think uh, my first memories uh, are things that I would, we'd make God's eyes, you know, typical 70s type fair. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of macrame, a lot of, uh, we were braiding and uh, beadwork. And so I still have some of my early things I made back then. I'd come back home and give to my mom. And uh, if you were to ask, you know, my early experiences was making beadwork, and mm -hmm. I used to love to braid, uh, it's like a four-way braid of uh, little plastic 
I forget what they call it, cord. Uh-huh. But I'd make keychains for my, my uncles and grandma. And, uh, I'd make little crosses to wear. Or, uh, and then there was one, <laughs> there was one kind of a uh, incident where I made this really cool God's eye. You know, it was an awesome God's eye. And the teacher said, you have to sell it because we're selling this at our arts and crafts. I said, well, I want to give this to my mom. And, you know, I'm going to take this home. This is my best God's eye. He said, no, you have to sell it. It's part of the process. And I don't like that. So my, uh, they wouldn't let me buy it either. I couldn't buy my own God's eye. They forced me to sell it. This teacher, and uh, I don't even recall who that was, but I just remember, I, I can't have my own God's eye. I made this, and you won't let me have it. So, and one of my uh, classmates bought it. And I said, well, that sucks. He won't, he won't give it back to me. He says, no, I'm going to give it to my mom. So I stole it back. And I hid it from him. And I snuck it back. I had to steal my own work and, and sneak it back in my suitcase back uh, to give it to my mom. I still have it. It's funny. My wife says, why do you still have that? <laughs> but yeah. Well, what's really cool is uh, my youngest daughter, she learned how to make God's eyes. And, and so her little God's eyes are next to mine, you know, <laughs> and it's the same era. So I had to really work hard to get that piece back. I collected myself, right? That's a great story, yes. <laughs> and you weren't commercially oriented. Yeah, <laughs> man, I wanted that thing. Um, so basically, then you were at Seneca for most of your elementary. Elementary, yeah. And you went to Sequoia. Well, I had After to go that, to or in between, school. I had to go to public school in Oklahoma City. Talk I about that a bit, it. okay? It, because I was uh, in a transit as a transitional teenager, you know, I, I'm 13, and suddenly all my friends are gone. I don't have any friends because all my friends are from the boarding school group that is from all over the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, friends from Florida, California, New York, uh, and then all over Oklahoma, and. You know, I had to go to a public school, and I didn't know anybody. So it was a uh, coming from eighth grade, mm-hmm. being king of the hill. You're the big eighth grader. Oh, ninth grade, you don't know anybody. And then uh, uh, I think the difference. I I talk about this when I tell stories that at Indian school in that in that native community, it was. Uh, your standard was based on your athletic ability, how tough you were, or your connections, kind of who you were in in that community. And when I went to public school, uh, it suddenly became based on your standing was based on what you had and uh, how much money you had. And we didn't have any, so I didn't have any standing. I was surprised to see ninth graders coming to school in in new cars. Like, wow, that's Really? You know, I barely had a bike, and I was happy to have a bike. So I, I still tell my family at the time I only had two shirts. <laughs> you know, and I had, I had a blue shirt and a yellow shirt. And I worked at the student store at the school in uh, May, yeah, Mayfield Junior High or something. And uh, the, the, the kids would tease me. So, oh, he's wearing the yellow one today. <laughs> he's wearing the blue one today. Um, but, you know, it was good enough at Indian school, but it wasn't good enough in public school. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that was a little bit of contrast. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And you worked at the student store to make a little money. and. Yeah, I can't remember why I did that. I was, I was ambitious. I wanted, to, I wanted to achieve, like, things there. Were you buying art supplies already? No, I didn't do arts and crafts in that time. Oh. Uh, I waited. I begged my mother to let me go back to Sequoia High School, where my friends were. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody there. And uh, she relented, let me go back to Sequoia. I eventually graduated from there. But my first roommates were the, the people that I knew back from Seneca Indian School. We call oh, them Seneca nice. Bros. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. So at Sequoia, <clears throat> what kind of an artistic base did you get? I made friends with the art teacher, and uh, it was really cool to uh, just create. I remember doing beadwork. I was into beadwork there. And uh, I still have some of that original, like I made a bracelet or something, uh, make chokers and you know, basic uh, basic elements like that. But already working a lot in 3D and yeah. kind of jewel, you know. 
we were fascinated with drawing. After meeting Kelly Haney, we were fascinated to always draw faces on everything. And so, yeah, I wasn't very good at it, but we always tried. <laughs> Who was your teacher, the art teacher at Sequoia? I can't recall his name offhand. I picture him. I, I could figure his name out, but I just can't quite remember. So you haven't had any encounters, though, with actually make, working with silver or anything, Joel? Not at that yet. time, no. What happens after you leave Sequoia? I graduated okay. in 1984, and I went to University of Oklahoma. They had a summer program. I. The one thing I'll give credit to the, being a public school is uh, while growing up in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City became a hub for uh, refugees coming from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. The Vietnam War ended in 75, and a lot of refugees came over, and I befriended uh, one guy, and as more refugees came in, that little community grew, so I hung out with the I couldn't find any Indians, so I hung out with the Vietnamese, and um, they taught me math, I taught them cuss words, and it's a good trade, right? Well, uh, in public school, I actually got ready for the ACT test. It was one bit of preparation mm -hmm. that paid off later, and uh, they didn't teach that at Indian school. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, Sequoia High School was still federally government-run, and uh, after the year I graduated, it was turned over to Cherokee Nation, and now they made it into a really fine school. Right. So it's real top of the line, hard to get into, <laughs> that kind of thing. Not when I was there. <laughs> uh, in fact, they have a coffee mug that says Sequoia High School School of Choice. Like, wow, that's total, you know, <laughs> total different world than I knew. Yeah. So um, I went on to University of Oklahoma through uh, an engineering program that noticed my ACT score and said this this guy has some skills and I had like 28 in sciences and. Uh, I had like a 24 or something. Anyways, it was, it was good enough to get in to OU. And I went to uh, school for mechanical engineering. Totally and was it an interest? Art. Right. Was it an interest of yours? or were you No, thinking? I didn't know about it. I didn't have a vision. I didn't know what an engineer did. But after I got educated about it, like, okay, uh, you know, this test score said that I do well in this. And uh, they need Indians in these fields. And so yeah, I committed to it. I didn't think about art. In fact, my roommate, Gerald Wofford, was an art major, and we would just uh, mercilessly tease him because his tests were uh, standing in front of a mirror and he would have to draw a self-portrait. And so he would do that on one side of the room, and I would sit on the other side of the room memorizing formulas and going through, you know, these books and numbers and... It was a, a big contrast, and all these years later, you know, I'm the guy drawing, you know, trying to do self-portraits and etc. And uh, you know, it came back on me a lot of teasing that <laughs> time. You weren't thinking of yourself as an artist; you were just no. kind of open to. Yeah. Yeah. So, what happened at OU to change your course or change your track? Just. Well, I did real well academically initially, and I was very involved in the Native community there, uh, American Indian Science and Engineering Scholar, and on the, I was the treasurer for the organization, and uh, also with American Indian Student Association. One year, we uh, they put on a pow at the Lloyd Noble Arena, and they didn't have any money to pay the drums, so I worked selling raffle tickets. I, you know, I didn't just walk around the bottom around the drum. I walked all the way up to the top of the stands. I found every little old lady, every guy, you know, with this girl over in the corner. I said, come on, she needs this blanket. You know, you're gonna need this later. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I, I made enough money for the drum groups. We had a successful powwow. You know, just being involved in, in the uh, activities. And then my, uh, but my grades are going down. So I thought, okay, uh, at, at the time, my, uh, my mother was in a, a job where she opened restaurants for a company. And she would go to a, a new city, uh, hire uh, people, develop uh, menus, and get the restaurant running, and then she'd move on. 
And she says, well, I'm going to Albuquerque. And uh, I'm supposed to open up a place in February. And I said, oh, shoot, that sounds interesting. I need a change. You know, I was getting uh, oh, kind of burned out in engineering. I thought, oh, I just need to change it up. So I uh, went out to Albuquerque from Norman, Oklahoma, and drove with my old, my old Indian car down I-40. And, <laughs> and uh, I took a, a trunk load of my uh, grandma's commodities. I visited grandma, got a <laughs> trunk load of commodities, went out there, and I called my mom and said, uh, you know, should I just get an efficiency and uh, wait till you get here and we can look for a place to get it? Or, uh, should I just get a bigger place right away? She said, well, I found out today I'm not going. I'm like, okay. And, uh, yeah, I just got a little efficiency, enrolled in school, and, uh, I stayed. And I at paid, UNM? I stayed at UNM in okay. their engineering program. And I ended up dropping out of there, uh, when I, I read a, a book, uh, an engineering assignment. And I read, uh, three pages in three hours. It wasn't very good. I realized I wasn't processing what I'm doing. In the meanwhile, I had met other natives here in the city, and one of them was Johnson Ball. He's mm -hmm. chopped off from uh, from Oklahoma, and he married a Navajo, and they called their business Chapo, right? And he would do metalwork, and his wife Lenita would do beadwork. It's kind of a role reversal because Choctaws are known for beadwork, and Navajo is known for metalwork. So uh, they embraced me. They were, he was welcoming. He's a friendly Oki, and, and uh, you know they they put up with me. And so he would teach me the basics: stamping, sawing, soldering, polishing. And uh, I stayed working with him in his studio. I never worked for him, but with him, um, he would give me the projects he didn't want to do anymore. And that was cool. You know, I was. I was hungry, you know, skinny little kids. I think when I moved out to uh, New Mexico, it was only uh, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. And uh, God, I went to OU when I was 17. I mm -hmm. just turned 17. So anyways, uh, I got interested in jewelry. And what was interesting is meeting other uh, families. There's this uh, one particular family that was, they were always really good to me, the Sudel family. They're half Kiowa, half Taos, Pueblo. And I remember seeing uh, that family, they would, uh, they'd make things and they'd sell it and they'd say, we got to go to an art show and they'd all travel and, and that just seemed fun, you know? I thought, wow, you can make things, you know, that you're inspired to do and find someone who appreciates it and you can actually pay your bills doing that. And so that's what I wanted to do. And I, I, I disenrolled from school. I said, I'm going to come back later and do this. Told myself I was. I told myself that for another three more years. I'm just doing this to like go back to school, and I realized I'm going to do this the rest of my career. You know, so I quit saying I'm going to go back to school. Yeah. So what was your first show? Your first art show that you did? Oh, I started. Uh, I think I started doing uh, the uh, the portal in Albuquerque, there in the plaza. But I would do little conferences, you know, like if the Indian conference came to town, uh, I would have my jewelry to get. Oh, I did the flea market. Oh, wow. I sold it. I just never realized. I sold at the Albuquerque flea market. Somebody might have a piece of yours from there. You never know, man. I had a good, uh, my high end was in the $8 range, you know. I would make things out of brass. Yeah. Were you, did you have a little bit of equipment? Or were you still working? I had converted a, uh, a swamp cooler motor into a buffer, and it had a cardboard box as the place to catch the dust. Uh, I had a homemade bench, um, a jeweler saw, and some basic stamps. And I had learned how to make some stamps, but I wasn't as good at it. Uh, the Sudo family had given me some stamps. Uh, I would. I think stamps at that time, uh, there's a place called Indian Jewelry Supply that sold stamps. So I could buy a stamp for $4. So I would gradually uh, build up my collection. And the stamps were my paintbrushes and metal. And 
each one is like a character in an alphabet. And then when you assemble them in a certain way, it lets you speak about something. So I started adding stories and symbolism using the characters of this alphabet and stamps. And it all followed that basic circle, square, triangle mm -hmm. pattern. And one of the things that uh, the guy who taught me, Johnson Bob, he, he was very into sawing things out. And he said, uh, he had told me, you know, don't copy my work. Because other people had copied him, and he was a little defensive about it, so he told me not to copy his work. So I went the other direction. I didn't do anything that had any kind of piercing or any saw work. And I stamped, I started stamping the coins, because I loved collecting mm -hmm. coins when I was uh, younger. And uh, that was my canvas, it was a coin. And so I used these stamps, and uh, that's how I started. I started going to the Albuquerque Flea Market and made some more friends downtown at the, uh, in the plaza in uh, Albuquerque. I actually got a vendor's license and started selling jewelry there on the sidewalk, and then I would do conferences. So those were my first shows, mm -hmm. and learning the Indian Conference Network, that let me travel to Oklahoma, and that let me you know, expand, I'll go do powwows, and then I uh, started, I was told, uh, you asked about shows, I was told, uh, well you can't get into Indian market, you have to be denied for at least five years before you can ever get in. And uh, I kind of believed that, I thought, well, these guys know what they're talking about. And I, I got in on my first year. So. And how many years into doing this were you at that point? My Just first, uh, I started making jewelry in, uh, I think, 1989. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was kind of in that circuit. And I, I did a uh, powwow, Santa Fe New Market, or Slyath, put on a powwow in 1993. And so I was part of that, and then I got into the Indian market in 95. I was too scared to apply. See, that's what it gets me, is like, I believed what they said, and I didn't apply till later. And so not realizing, it, you know, everybody's story's different. Right. Yeah, I don't have to have their experience. I can, you know, I can have my own experience. So I didn't know that then. What would you consider your breakthrough show then? Would it have been Indian market? Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think if you're talking in terms of a, of a show and that, that commercial aspect and mm -hmm. coming on to a, an Indian art scene, so uh, I call it the ribbon chasing era because when you start getting some recognition from a judge, whether that judge is another native artist, whether they're a collector or museum professional, and then people regard that ribbon. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I started understanding how that uh, affects your standing and recognition. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, someone like my Uncle John, he wasn't recognized, but we regarded him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't put all my stock into, you know, what a, a ribbon or that kind of award winning would bring. So I had a, a small era of ribbon hunting. I've got a box of ribbons and I've, I've got a few... You know, like, I won Best of Show at Red Earth. Uh, I was a fellowship winner at Santa Fe New Market. And, you know, I was in my, I had, one of the things we talk about is having a ribbon shirt, you know, physically attaching your ribbons to a ribbon shirt, you know, that. Yeah. And, you know, you tease people about their ribbon shirt. Is that a first place? Or if it's red, you know, you're number two, right? So that was uh, my, my thoughts about coming onto the scene mm -hmm. and joining that circuit of Santa Fe New Market, the Herd Museum in Phoenix. Uh, there were several shows like uh, oh, Litchfield Park, uh, Pueblo Grande in mm -hmm. uh, December in Phoenix. And there's a circuit. Mm -hmm. And then you start to understand the bigger conferences, all the ACES conferences. I used to make the, the pen, handmade pens for ACES. I would be in my little studio, okay. hammering each one of those little lines, and then setting a little coral or a little turquoise or a black, black onyx in there uh, to sell at the Ace Conference. I was making those one at a time. I thought there's got to be a better way. So that's when I started casting. Okay. Yeah, 
and uh, I figure if it's a corporate account, you know, they're not, they're more concerned about the price, and they yes. don't care about some guy, you know, sweating and, you know, laboring, they just want what they want. Right. So, um, the business part of it is kind of hard, isn't it? And I remember that your wife traveled with you, too, to a number of shows. How, how did you figure out the business part? I'm still figuring it out because it changes, you know, the dynamics. So you can you can never just be one thing. And it goes back to, uh, you know, my experience isn't your experience. And it's not, um, you know, to, to say I've ever figured it out, shoot, it's changing. It's changing now. And so I, I want to uh, make a point to be adaptable. Uh, you know, my primary interest is my family. So I'll take care of that. Uh, you know, artistically, uh, being able to teach them, hand them something. I've always said I want them to have something to, you know, work with uh, as a as a backup, as a base. You know, and they can go do whatever they want in life. But I, you know, as an artist, it's my, you know, obligation. I want them to. Uh, I want them to have the tools to find their own way artistically. They're going to have different skills and make different mm -hmm. uh, motivations. And I want to show them how to put it into a medium that they want. And so, you know, figuring out the business part of it, you know, that's another hat. Mm -hmm. uh, I like something that Suzanne Harjo told me. She says, you know, when I don't feel like writing something, but I, you know, got to pay the bills and get in there, I put on a green shirt. And so, yeah. Uh, I'll go put on a green shirt. We talk about that. It's the green shirt uh, <laughs> phenomenon. And sometimes you just got to go to work and, and make a paycheck. And so making business happen in jewelry uh, can be a lot of things. It can be wholesaling because you don't want to deal with the public or you don't have time. Or, uh, you know, I, I've got friends on the res. They don't want to deal with people. Mm -hmm. And so they want to sit at home and create and let uh, someone at a trading post or a dealer uh, handle it for them and I always thought well shoot you can get retail you know I'm I'm a good talker so I'll get out there and talk it up and and make time to travel and I, I enjoyed those parts of it but now with the uh, introduction of the internet and websites um, and you have a nice looking one yeah it's always changing you know I just changed it from a CSS uh, file format to uh, a WordPress site and that needs to be developed you know in 1995, I was one of the first natives to sell uh, my artwork on the internet. And so we had a, a, an old time computer, which is new, cutting edge uh, at the time. But we set up a computer in the center of the plaza. And uh, there were uh, several natives that had received a grant uh, to do technology. And I was kind of the, I was the focal point of that project, so they used my artwork, and uh, we knew each other from Asus, and we set up my website. I had flashing uh, feather icons that would wave, and I had uh, hair ties and bracelets mm -hmm. and uh, you know different things on this website, and KennethJohnson.com. So there was a scientist from Los Alamos who had my domain name even that early. And no one wanted that stuff then, but you know I. I had worked hard to get one. So, uh, you talk about, you asked me about, you know, what does it take to adjust in business? And, you know, I wanted to innovate in that format. I didn't want to open a store. Because opening a store meant you had to get up and be there every day. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, you know, create and travel or, you know, take care of people custom, custom wise. And the internet let me do that. Now, you, you have um, dealt with a couple of galleries over the years. What was kind of your gallery breakthrough, do you think? I don't ever feel like I've broken through with the gallery. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, had, I've had some good galleries. Um, this year, God, who were my galleries? Uh, I dealt with galleries in Albuquerque, like uh, Wright's Gallery or... Uh, Weems Gallery, mm -hmm. they were really good. I always like Weems. Uh, Marianne Weems is the owner, and uh, she's just so enthusiastic. And 
I would always just go up and just twirl her around. My <laughs> wife teases me. She said, oh, you're just going to go twirl them around and sell jewelry. Yeah, that's, that's what works. I'll do that. And uh, she said, as long as they use that, you know, write that check, I'm fine with that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I dealt with some galleries there uh, locally. And then I, I started expanding a little bit. Uh, currently, I'm with uh, Garland's in Sedona uh, with... Uh, Red Stick Gallery, which is a new, a new gallery through uh, Muskogee Creek Nation, mm-hmm. and it's an online and a physical gallery there in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. Uh, also, uh, Shiprock Trading mm-hmm. here in Santa Fe. There's a store called Ortega's on the plaza right there on the corner. Uh, I used to sell, uh, oh, I forget the other place. It's now called Maloose, but it used to be, I uh, can't remember the name of that. So I didn't rely very heavily on galleries, but a lot of my friends make the meat of their uh, their living through galleries, and it enables them to not have to deal with people. Mm-hmm. And that thing, that that leads to where I'm at. I'm a custom guy. I, I make right. you know unique things, and that's enabled me to work with the uh, Supreme Court justices. So when did you start getting into southeastern designs? Well, I became aware of the depth, the history, the richness of what's here in the Southwest. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned, I like how, I like knowing how things happen. Uh, when I was a kid, I would watch water run down a, a hill and it would start to gather and then it would get stronger and stronger and it would make its own path a lot of times. And we play in that, you know, making dams or putting boats down it. And uh, I was fascinated how these little streams occurred. And thinking about the art of the Southwest and learning, you know, these uh, these styles came up from somewhere somehow, and they've evolved. And there's the sacred, there's the traditional, and there's the commercial. Um, there's the aesthetic, you know, that just matches your couch. But there's a, a role of all these things. And understanding that the Harvey House era really shaped a big part of the, the, the commerce here. Mm-hmm. Not, not only the art, because art pre-existed all that. But how it uh, started supporting families by them selling it to tourists. And that's through the railroads coming through. Mm -hmm. So you asked me about the Southeast, all that bypasses. So a lot of our culture, you know, uh, I'm involved in a, in a canoe project for, uh, the, the Muscogee canoe project, but our, our people's removal from the forced walk from Alabama and Georgia to Oklahoma, we weren't going to carry any canoes. And, uh, you know, a lot of things didn't make it. But I know that we have such a rich, rich heritage and a rich history. And I can see it in, uh, you know, the resilience of people. And then start looking into the archaeology, seeing pottery, the woven mats, the textiles, uh, and in uh, the old metalwork build copper embossed pieces and all the shell work hand carved and then starting to understand you know part of survival uh, you know really depended on the ability to make these things spiritually culturally uh, and that's before uh, before the introduction of uh, uh, you know other cultures mm-hmm. into our culture so I, I started looking at it and studying it uh, physically, and I could tell, uh, you know, I, I received a, a fellowship from uh, uh, the National Museum of the American Indian to study. I received a fellowship from uh, SWAYA, and those were uh, integral in my study, in, in, in the formal studying process. Because I can consider a lot of things just, you know, by knowledge, you know, being around, but it didn't 
you know, there's so much more to know once you delve deeper. And, and so I got to, to travel. I got to travel just to focus on that and develop the architecture of, oh, I started to understand uh, the, the eras these belong to. The yeah, seminal patchwork is of this era mm -hmm. and the introduction of, uh, you know, there's, there's tourism mm -hmm. affected the, the things uh, and survival, which is the basic, you know, that's a basic thing. There's spiritual survival, there's cultural survival, and there's, there's just, you need to eat. And that's why it's important for me to provide for my family, you know, not just my nuclear family, but also my extended family. And, you know, we still regard my uncle John Watkins, who created in an era, you know, of the 70s of painting. And that was just something that was cool. It was one of the things he did, right? And he was a real character. But that, uh, you know, wasn't a nine to five. He just got to express and move on, mm -hmm. and do everything else and come back to this. And it was like an orbit. And you got to have that as one of your, you know, one of the things to get by. So I, I like to tell people, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a good thing. And you can interpret how you want it. And our ancestors did it. Then time was a different thing. Materials and technique were different, but it was still an expression. And so me coming out to the Southwest, seeing the breadth and history of all this uh, jewelry, pottery, weavings, and then the whole art market scene, and wow, I was just amazed. And I thought, but I'm, I'm not from the Southwest. So what is my role? You know, I can just replicate what they do, but it didn't seem sincere to me. It didn't seem real. So yes, I could, I could do this. And then I had to go back and learn our own iconography and what's, uh, you know, one of the important things of going back into the Southeast motifs some time I spent in Florida, I was, I love Seminole Patchwork. And by the way, I'm Seminole. Yes. <laughs> and I, uh, I got to uh, talk to, I was always asking, uh, kind of like my grandma, I would pester my grandma, and I'd pester these, these uh, ladies out in Everglades. What's this mean? What's that mean? You know, what's this patchwork? And they always start off saying, uh, well, this one looks like uh, telephone poles. This one looks like cardio. This one looks like sawgrass. And I, I remember that resonated, it looks like. So it was just an association. It was not a definitive, this is this, and this is always only that. And it gave me the freedom to start to interpret things. Mm -hmm. I understood, okay, I have a lot to say. And then referring back to the stamps, I started collecting, you know, I would put a uh, stamp in the center and do a, a, a stamp design that radiates out from that. And to me, that represented a word. And if you throw a rock into a, a pond or water and you see the ripples go out, it's like a word. And if you say, I love you, and those are good words that go out. I would say you have a harsh word or a strong word mm -hmm. or a, a power word throw that in, and those, those sharp, they're like sharp words. And so that's how I'm able to talk in my jewelry and, and uh, you know, kind of recognize the gist of things. Uh, strong symbols like sun, moon, and star, our oldest daughter, her middle name is Star, Seneca, Sarah Star. And I think about, uh, you know, Muscogee iconography, pottery, I'll, I'll weave that into, uh, telling a, uh, an emergence story, you know. Um, you know, like I said uh, earlier, I grew up in Indian schools. I didn't grow up traditional. And so I've had to go back and reapproach uh, many people and experiences and uh, study pieces to get my own understanding. Because it's not going to be handed to me, so I have to go get it. Mm -hmm. That's how I get on top of the mountain, so I get a better view. 
We'll talk a little bit about the canoe project, and then we'll talk a little bit about your techniques and processes. Okay. But talk about the canoe project. The canoe project is something I happened into. Many years ago, I met, uh, I met a gentleman named Mike Berryhill. Mike Berryhill is somebody who, uh, he's a Muscogee Creek person uh, living in Oklahoma, and he, uh, he, his uh, desire, his dream is to uh, see the revival of the uh, traditional bow back to our people. And I uh, befriended him and went to uh, some bow shoots and, uh, you know, he, he just decided he liked me somehow, I don't know. And uh, I remember one day here in Santa Fe, a man named Judge Moore, Patrick Moore, came out he said, I'm coming to Santa Fe, I need to visit you. Okay. And I uh, rang the doorbell, and, and uh, when I opened the door, he handed a bow to me. And he says, uh, Mike Berryhill knows your height, the length of your shoulder, the, 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 your arm span, and he created this for you. It takes, each one takes at least a year, sometimes two years to make. Mm -hmm. In the collecting of the wood, the right type of wood, from the right part of the tree, and uh, he created this for you. Someone that spent time on me, they focused in on me, and wow! So, uh, so uh, going back to the Muskogee Canoe Project, what do bows have to do with canoes? Well. I saw on the internet, on Facebook, this guy named John John Brown, who was, uh, he had, he had uh, gotten a tree, he worked for the Muscogee Creek Nation, he got a, a 200 year old tree from Alabama, they cut it in half, they carved a canoe to leave in Alabama, and they did, uh, near Horseshoe Bend area, and then they took the other half and took it to Oklahoma, and there he was carving it. And uh, I saw all these pictures of everybody gathering around, kids, everybody regarded this canoe. It was very attractive. It drew people in. People wanted to touch it and, you know, re you know figure out how to work, you know, what's this about? I saw security guards. I saw, you know, tourists. And people would just visit to check on the status of how it's going. So I saw this, uh, I was watching this online, and then I went to Oklahoma for a, uh, I was in Okmulgee, and I was at one of the uh, Chickadexi Sajogi, or bow, bow makers, uh, bow shoot, right there next to the tribal complex in Okmulgee. And I asked John John Brown, I said, how's that canoe project going? He said, oh, well, you know, it's, it's going slow, and we got, and I, th I thought, well, it had made sense to me in my travels that there are, canoe people, canoe cultures, you know, everywhere else, has he connected with the, uh, you know, local tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, what about Seminoles? So you got a canoe in the tribal seal, mm -hmm. you know, and he says, no, I haven't really, uh, you know, we haven't, there's nobody really to connect with. There's, they don't have programs going on. I said, well, I was aware of an event called, uh, Paddle to Nisqually. And there's the Nisqually Reservation in Washington State, and they were hosting a uh, canoe gathering. And the canoe cultures there, uh, you know, they have uh, there's a lot based mm -hmm. on based on travel, and, and uh, they would decorate their canoe paddles with their tribal signs, and that represented who they were. You know, when you approach land or when you approach shore on a canoe and you pull up your, your canoe paddle, it represents who you are. And so, uh, you know, I said, we should connect with these people. Me and my big mouth, you know, I didn't know John John that well at that time. <laughs> and he says, yeah, we should. And we, uh, I made a few phone calls and we got a, a f the way those uh, tribes up there regard uh, canoes is they, it's family based and they represent nations. And so, John John Brown and I went to Paddleton Nisqually in 20, uh, was it 2016? 2016, 
2015. 2015, I think, maybe. Yeah, it's all blur, right? <laughs> and we were welcomed as representatives of, of Muskogee Nation. And we were uh, privileged to pull with the Samish Nation in their canoe. And, you know, we got to be a part of their process and, and their last day of their journey, just to even approaching the squad, that's a big deal. Yeah. Well, we were on a support boat uh, next to, uh, these, these canoes are big canoes. Mm -hmm. I think there were uh, at least 12 people. So there's uh, 12, maybe 13. They're all pulling in this canoe. And you have one person in the back, it's the captain guiding it. And John, John Brown and I were on this support boat. Uh, it's a fishing boat, just, you know, going, you know, nearby. And then, you know, if someone got tired or if they had a need, need for anything like water, you know, we could stop and, and uh, change people out or water. But while we were going alongside, I said, man, this is, uh, this is really cool to be a part of. And John John said, you know, it was part of Mike Berryhill's vision, original vision, not only for the return of the bow, but also for the return of the traditional canoe. And man, wow. uh, heart just, yeah. wow, I'm a part of something bigger. You know, I, I, didn't, men I didn't mention it, but uh, uh, Mike Berryhill passed away. And he, he uh, passed the mantle of leadership to John John mm -hmm. Brown. And when John John mentioned that to me, you know, I realized um, it's not an accident that I'm involved. I, under, I understand I'm a part of something, and I don't have full, clear vision of why or where this is going. But I need to take it up. Mm -hmm. So the same way the, the bow affected me, like, whoa, I'm powerful. Right. Uh, so the so, facts. So this is... Uh, the first carved canoe uh, from, it's a replica from that first canoe uh, that was carved out of Alabama. So John John just gave this to me last week. He was here in, in New Mexico for a conference. And uh, you know, it was something pretty special to me. He said uh, something that was really impactful, that this tree was growing when our people were still there living. Mm -hmm. And so to have this element, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's important because uh, a canoe, while maybe on the face of it is not relevant to this time of cars and airplanes, that it has to do with culture. And the speaking of a canoe has to do with language, has to do with our old songs that we need to reclaim and reform, remake has to do with health and wellness, the pulling of a canoe. You have to get ready to pull a canoe. You just get out there, you're gonna be sore the next day if you're not in shape to pull one of these. And uh, in art, you know, I made, uh, I made a canoe paddle that was from this original wood of the first canoe. This is the first canoe that's been carved in, you know, 150, 160 years. Mm -hmm. They weren't carried on the trail of tears, so, so or you know, on that uh, the trail of suffering. So uh, this is these are positive things that are, I think, good for our people. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people need uh, you know, something to regard. They need to be about something. Uh, I think American culture is about getting stuff and working on a job that you don't like. And instead, oh yeah, we have a lot to uh, draw from, you know, positive things about our people and communities. And so being a part of that, uh, the Muskogee Canoe Project reminds us of these things. We're all on this journey to learn uh, the same way that I have to learn to pull a bow and shoot and make arrows and, uh, uh, you know, this canoe journey. And you've made paddle. We made a paddle. So uh, one of the em emblems, and that, that's what I created here, this is a wax carving of the paddle that I created uh, as a thank you to mm -hmm. the, the nations uh, in Washington. Uh, we were invited by a Lummi Nation, uh, pulled with the Samish Nation, uh, one of my other friends, Upper Skagit, 
and uh, you know they were very welcoming and accommodating. So I created a, a paddle, John John carved a paddle, and then I uh, decorated it. And it, what was really cool is uh, I started decorating with these southeast motifs, and it turned out to be uh, it started to look like a duck. I haven't carved any duck designs, you know, it's uh -huh. new to me. And so I, I call I call my cousin Joe Sulphur, and I call different people. And, Said, what you know? What about ducks in Muscogee culture? And ducks are very powerful because they they transit the sky mm -hmm. and they fly. Mm -hmm. They're in water, and they're underwater. They're very powerful. They transit these three worlds. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you pull a canoe paddle, it it does that. It does that. And so that was a good sign, you know. And uh, so I make. Um, in the process of making this into jewelry. Oh, nice. I'm a jeweler, I can't help it. I gotta <laughs> right. make this into jewelry. <laughs> right. um, we got to visit and connect with other artists like Ed Noise Cat. He made mm -hmm. a really cool paddle, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so we're working to do a canoe paddle project that encompasses, uh, I went in February 2017 and went down to uh, Tampa, Florida and visited with Bobby Henry. Bobby Henry's an uh, 81 year old medicine man. I mean that guy's fresh off knee surgery. And he still outruns all his uh, all his people down there. That guy's ball of energy. Uh, his cell phone's always blowing up. I mean he's fun, funny guy. But we went to his place and we carved a, a, a series of. Uh, uh, we met with another uh, Seminole named uh, Pedro Zapata, and he had gotten a piece of uh, cypress. And cypress is hard to get because it takes a long time to grow, and it's our a lot of it's been harvested, so you can't find old growth cypress. But uh, Pedro was able to uh, uh, get us a plank of cypress. He brought it to Bobby Henry's place, and we were able to cut uh, three canoe paddles out of that. Now, I went there with Kelly Haney, someone who I've known as a little boy, mm -hmm. and uh, he was there with us along with uh, Creek citizen George Alexander. Who's a painter? And he's currently studying in the Italy now. Proud of that kid. And so you have uh, I'm the elder, I'm the medium, and you have the youth. <laughs> and we're carving these canoe paddles there in Tampa. And uh, Pedro Zapato uh, took us down to Big Cypress where he works and works with the museum. And, and he's carving his paddle. Kelly Haney uh, took his paddle back to Norman, Oklahoma. And he's, uh, he's carved in an egret, beautiful egret, mm -hmm. inlaid with glass. Mm -hmm. So he's got a very unique uh, piece. Uh, the, the paddle I carved, inlaid with uh, copper and pink mussel shell. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that duck has a copper, I mean a pink mussel shell eye and copper accents and the weavings cool. in it. And there are things that are elemental of uh, Muscogee culture. So they're powerful, and we're using the, um, the, the canoe paddle as a canvas, and everyone will interpret it differently. Uh, we've also got uh, a canoe paddle going to Tony Scott, who lives in Los Angeles, and she's an accomplished carver. She does incredible, incredible uh, installation works. And we're excited to build a collage of these canvases to uh, talk about our own experiences as artists. Right. Oh, that's that's going to be wonderful. So um, let's talk a little bit about your process and techniques, and especially I think maybe the cam stuff, just a little bit for a layman, mm -hmm. how that's helped um, shape your the jewelry that you do now. Well, I use uh, computer aid design, which is CAD, and then there's CAD. computer aid machining is right. CAM, and or manufacturing, and I do both. Uh, I have a uh, uh, I use a software called Matrix, and I had, uh, got involved with Matrix. Uh, I got to know the people who, who uh, ran the software out of Moline, Illinois, and uh, you know, good people. And I follow. I just kind of follow that 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 program. I know there's other programs out there, but this is the one I'm kind of committed to. It's like being a Ford or Chevy guy. Right, you know? right. Yeah. Once you start <laughs> off there, it's you know the nomenclature. Well. Uh, I, I work with that software and it basically is controversial because the impression is it's mass production. In reality, it's a hammer. And 
it's a tool and it's uh, I've been working with it for about nine years so it takes time nine years to learn how to press the button wow. in a certain way and to help create uh, uh, digital designs and so again I've worked with uh, Enoch Kelly Haney and producing his designs his large sculptures into jewelry yeah, it's, wow. it's exciting because yes. I can get to because I know he works with yes, wow. Yeah, so I get to interpret his pieces in a, to a three D context. Oh, cool. Uh, in two thousand ten, uh, the Muskogee Creek Nation uh, purchased the Creek Council House, mm -hmm. and a, uh, uh, the leadership at the time asked me to can you make a coin, a commemorative coin? So I used three D to create the design, and mm -hmm. I got to. Uh, incorporate southeast uh, motifs into that and I recognized the time. I went to uh, Sequoia High School on Gifted and Talented Day to do a demonstration of how uh, I used computer aid design, which is a lot newer when I did it, Yes. you know, seven years yes. ago. Uh, and so I don't know what they thought. They never had, they never <laughs> invited me back, so I don't know, I don't know what I did. But, uh, you know, it was exciting to share the technology and the technique for mm -hmm. the project, because uh, in the past uh, I've created uh, I've created the crowns for the Seminole Nation princesses. They have mm -hmm. the senior miss, Miss Seminole, junior miss, and little miss. So there's four crowns. I have a picture of my daughter wearing the little miss <laughs> crown. She's so cute, and uh, well, she's 15 now. You know, and she's right. a little girl. Right. Anyways. Uh, I used computer aid design to recreate the seal on that. And then I hand fabricated all the elements around that. But mm -hmm. what was important is that uh, those crowns are, what's important is to get the, uh, the tribal seal because mm -hmm. you're representing the, the nation. But the elements is that tribal seal sits inside of a canoe. So if you ever get a chance to see oh. the Seminole Nation crowns, the seal sits inside of a canoe. That's a shape. It's not mm -hmm. obvious. Right, when right, you look right, for it, you'll see right, it. Right, right. And then there's swirls around it, which represent wind. And inside of each one is a coral. It represents the blood of the veterans. You know, not just U.S. military, but all the veterans within our nation that, that fought for our people to survive and be, be here. Mm -hmm. And so when those princes go out, you know, they have all this you know, symbology. And, uh, you know, there's some copper elements and stars and suns. And, so I, I, use, uh, I use CAD in my approach to achieve a project. And I see it as another tool. It's not a replacement for any kind of skill. It takes way more skill on my part. I, I think a lot of people are, uh, you know, they, they see it as a mechanization of the industry. Um, but it still has to come from mm -hmm. here right. and here on some level. So I, I'm confident I embrace it and uh, I'll do more, you know. And it gives you a lot of options when you're customizing things for people too. Oh yeah, I got a lot to do. Pieces, and I heard overheard you talking to a collector who already had a piece of yours, and yeah. therefore there's kind of a through line that they're that they like, or yeah. yeah. So I love it. Was just looking on your website, and I saw like the cognac diamond, which. It's so pretty, it's such yeah. a pretty color. Yeah. And I was just wondering a little bit about some of your more unusual materials and platinum. I know you work with platinum and those things are expensive. Yeah. I like to work with finer things and that's part of why I work under a microscope. I, I did learn, you know, there's the gist of things when you can just be real gestural and work. But I keep going back toward finer, finer things, a finer design, and re re refining uh, what I do. So, yeah, I've done some rough work, and I like to continue to refine it into a, uh, not only finer design, but finer materials. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be appreciated there. Uh, I was part of a, a museum of art and design had a program called, I mean, uh, uh, an exhibition called Changing Hands, which was really cool because I had created this. Uh, it was a four-tier, 18-karat uh, yellow gold gorget, and it, it told a creation story of these turtles, and each design was connected 
uh, under the turtle shell would be the the motif to the next gorget, which connected to the motif under the turtle shell to the next gorget, and so that's how the pieces were all related in the total creation story in these symbols. And I used 18 karat yellow gold with uh, platinum uh, coins for the turtle shells. I had a mechanism to replace them, re release them, and you can wear them as individual pendants. Gosh. And I used uh, also a peridot from uh, San Carlos Apache Reservation. And these stones were all had different cuts, swirl cut, check cut, brilliant cut, and it was really cool to uh, just see how fine mm -hmm. you can make it. And I felt that it gave appreciation. But in that exhibit, they put this 18 karat platinum next to you know something made out of bottle caps or concrete or uh, you know coat hangers. And so it still gave the, uh, the essence of what the artist wanted to express. And in that right context, mm -hmm. you can appreciate it. Mm -hmm. It was great. I loved that. <laughs> yeah, that was an important show. And um, that was an amazing piece. Um, did you then sell it later? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got more to make. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm restless. I got a lot to create. That, in fact, and gorgeous uh, are one of the things that you're known for. I yeah, think, the gorget is a symbol of uh, achievement, and it represents somebody who either negotiated or is recognized by the people as a leader, or they took it in battle. You know, it's the old, mm -hmm. old times. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the modern gorgets are uh, symbols of uh, like a European. Uh, armor, mm -hmm. you know, like the Roman armor, last vestiges of Roman armor, but they were also uh, pre-contact, you know, we had crescent shapes and round shapes, a lot of uh, uh, copper and uh, shell, right. mostly shell, even stones, Right. so I, I recognize it's, it's another canvas to me. Right. Um, well, you've talked a little bit about um, the research that you've done and that you do do, continue to do. Do you do any old-fashioned sketching? A sketch, of yeah. Things? Okay. Yeah, they're so rough. Uh -huh. I have to admire Alan Hauser and the sketches he does. You know, we, we uh, uh, my apprentice and I, his uh, Hopi guy named uh, Emmett Nabakuku, and we met, at, uh, we met at this museum one time to go check out the Alan Hauser exhibit. And, you know, I was impressed that along with the original artwork, he had sketches. And I thought, man, my sketches are so rough, man. They'd never be frameable, you know? But yeah, that I, I sketch. I, I do a lot of sketches and, you know, I, I keep having to try to resolve it. You know, I worked with another artist named uh, Dan Lomahaftoa, uh, late mm -hmm. Dan, Dan Lomahaftoa. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was my best friend here in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. Well, I did a jewelry line with him. And in fact, my wife was wearing it uh, last night. Uh, it was a portal. It represents, uh, you know, kind of a passage through, mm -hmm. real classic Dan stuff. And the the, uh, the jewelry sketches that Dan would submit had a lot of shading. And I thought, you know, in jewelry, it's a little tougher to shade mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a painting, you know, you can get a lot of color and contrast. And, but in jewelry, you have to have some line art to work from and then start to build in your depths and shades, heights. And, and so that was one of the issues I had working with him that I had to resolve even my, in my own work. So I have an idea and I'll sketch it. And uh, I still have to achieve it in metal. You know, are those recessed lines? Are they raised lines? Mm -hmm. You know, is that an overlay? Is that, you know, have to figure out how to achieve that line in your work. Mm -hmm. So, what is your creative process from the time you get an idea? Sometimes it's very urgent. Like, I gotta do it now while the person's here and just, you know, there's a sense of urgency that, that it's really fun energy to work from. And it's, it's kind of desperate. It's kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to sit and sit on it for too long because, uh, you know, that the opportunity can leap. You know, if someone's getting married, if, if someone's here in town, or if there's a, uh, a 
you just got to have it now kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Other projects are different. It's a different energy. And you get to ruminate on things and you really want to draw out. Uh, there's one particular bracelet I made that it, uh, you know, I feel like I traveled inwardly to get the designs for this. It was, uh, I, I had a, it's a bracelet. I have it here. If you want to see it? Yeah, let's let, let me pull it up. Let me grab it real yeah. quick. So this is a bracelet. It's 18 karat tufa cast. And what I did is uh, the the format. These are sun symbols, and uh, the client he had been buying gemstones online. And he says, "Can you do something with these?" And so I got to arrange, wow. rearrange, and wow. and keep playing with these shapes that incorporated Muscogee designs. And so uh, this took years to do. Yes. Even though physically I can do this quickly, but in reality to do it justice mm -hmm. for him. And, and what was really cool, he was patient and he, uh, he appreciated it. It had real uh, energy that he, you know, he, could, he got it. Right. And so what I feel like is, uh, uh, you know, he it allowed me to go travel, uh, like, artistically in my mind, to put these lines in, in this arrangement, in these spaces. So that was part of the uh, process. So that sometimes there's urgency, and it feels really good and gratifying, and, and then you can move on. But other times, I felt like I was journeying uh, to a mountain. And uh, I really went deep to get these patterns. Sure. And so now, I, uh, uh, this is 2017 at the uh, August Santa Fe New Market. Uh, a friend of mine, Pat Pruitt, he's Laguna Pueblo, and he won Best of Show. And what he did is a, uh, a CAD designed uh, steel, like, I don't know all his materials, but he did a pot. And it was, uh, it won't hold water, but it's a really cool pot. And he said uh, it, it was the refinement of earlier designs. And that's why I feel about mm -hmm. this. I get to go back and with, I have more skills uh, to approach previous designs that were important to me. That I traveled to go uh, get, I was in the right place and the right time and the right understanding to be able to put these into metal. And so... Uh, I related to what Pat said. They only go back and refine with new, new technology, materials, technique. Right. Uh, last fall, a uh, a Bulgarian master silversmith named Valentin Yotkov came to Santa Fe, and there's a uh, there's a Choctaw artist who lives here in Santa Fe. His name's David McElroy. Uh, he I guess he had already taken classes with him. He invited him. Uh, over to his place to put on a workshop. So a bunch of us Indian artists went over to David's house and uh, we took the class. And so I have more skills to incorporate into my work, which is represent. And previously I had only been able to do flat uh, line art of mm -hmm. patterns, mm -hmm. uh, or I could do it in 3D. I could realize things in 3D by wax carving or with a computer aid design. But now I have another tool in my in my uh, toolbox. That's so cool. Well, looking back on your career so far, what do you, would you say has been one of the high points? Oh, I feel like I haven't got there yet. Like I said, I'm restless to do more. <laughs> so I, I, have, uh, I have a lot to draw from. I know making pieces for uh, like Kelly Haney's inauguration. That was an important piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, being called upon by the Oklahoma State Supreme Court to make pieces for Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor uh, while showing at Santa Fe New Market, Ruth Bader Ginsburg walking by my booth and ordering a custom piece, uh, making uh, uh, special pieces for uh, the Canadian Supreme Court Justice McLaughlin. I forget her first name. And, you know, uh, working with our tribal chiefs. I made a piece for a uh, woman man killer, uh, Charlie Soap, you know, they came by my booth and, uh, you know, chiefs like uh, Perry Beaver, mm -hmm. um, 
Muskogee Creek Chiefs, Perry Beaver, uh, George Tiger, uh, and being able to uh, say this is an important piece, and if you're going to be out there in a public profile, you know, I, I like uh, making a piece that has some gravity to it. Mm -hmm. And so when you're out there and you have uh, something that's uh, commensurate to your position, you know. That's cool. How about a low point? Oh, I think when you feel someone doesn't appreciate what you do, mm -hmm. you put everything into something and, and it goes over someone's head or, or it just goes right past them and they, uh, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. And then, so I think connecting with your audience is critical. Uh, some, some artists are never appreciated in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that's tough, man. But it's really, uh, I really respect people that are, continue to create. Because uh, you don't always have to have uh, a sale for it to be credible. You know, mm -hmm. I think our society does that. And that, I, you know, I, that's one part of it. But to know the importance of art on all these other levels, you know, like I talked about with the Canoe Project, I don't know why I'm a part of that, but I know it's important. Yes. And so a low point can be when you don't have vision if you abandon your art, that would be a true low point. Because mm -hmm. uh, you, you're not considering your calling. You know, I got stuff to do. That's what I'm restless. I, <laughs> you know, it's tough to say what was my best. You know, I've got a lot of uh, highlights. But, uh, you know, and I think the low points are uh, when you get bogged down in other details. And mm -hmm. I read a really cool book, Any Apprentice That Works With Me is assigned to read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. And he basically talks about any inspiration you have is like the sun. And that sun will cast a shadow. And if you follow that shadow, you're away, going away from your, what you're meant to do. Mm -hmm. So if we recognize that, continue to work, make art, and just motate on you know that's in the book you read it you'll know what i'm talking about it sounds great i am yeah. going to read it <laughs> okay well we're going to take a look at a couple of examples of your work here all right sounds good all right so kenneth you want to tell me a little bit about your work here you said i don't have to jump in the shop you know i'm going to jump in the shop sure. i have to uh talk about this this is a piece that has to do with panther clan this is a similar patchwork design this is into a 20 Balboa coin. It's the world's largest coin. It has Seminole Patrick motif so in a uh, counterclockwise pattern. And uh, down in Florida, Panther Clan is very powerful. I created mm -hmm. this as a bling piece for a couple of my uh, friends, Spencer and Zachary Batiste. They won a okay. uh, MTV Video Music Award uh, for their protests uh, involving the Standing Rock mm -hmm. dispute and... Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, so while they're on stage with Taboo, I'm making them some native bling. That's and, uh, so, so cool. That's and the claws a, underneath. Yeah, right? so I'll be, yeah. Uh, so they, they were designed as bear claws, but you know what, they're panther claws right now. <laughs> Anyways, uh, one of the other things I did was, cool. uh, because they won an MTV VMA, so I made this little one, uh, it's still in progress, but uh, this is a, a statue of the Moon Man that they won, and I put a Seminole jacket onto the Moon Man. It's going to have a Seminole uh, Tribe of Florida flag on it. Oh, that's a cool Yeah, so there's cool. two brothers, so I'm making two of them. <laughs> yes. They'll be inside of a gorget or something, you know, some kind of bling. Right, right, right. Oh, we're going to hurt nobody when they're swinging around. Uh, this piece is a, uh, it's a silver inkwell, and it was done as a replica of the one that sits in the United States Capitol. Mm -hmm. This was originally commissioned by a congressman here in New Mexico, Steve Pierce, who uh, uh, he wanted to give it as a gift to the King of uh, Jordan. Uh, so this piece is currently, uh, this is the second of four. The first one is already in Washington, D.C. And if you've ever watched the uh, State of the Union Address, Every president since 1819 
has stood in front of this. In fact, the secretary of uh, uh, the speakers of the house have their pay portrait painted in, while sitting in front of this. So these were inkwells uh, oh, for nice. treaty signing. You know how Indians love treaties, so uh, you know <laughs> uh, the eagle and the uh, the snakes uh, representing uh, unity and uh, oh, I forgot the symbolism of it of that for this, but. Uh, that was a that was a really cool project. Uh, this no one. No kidding. Uh, this our I call this our life symbol. Mm -hmm. It's a creek knot. That's another informal name for it, but it represents Muscogee Nation very well. So I'm just uh, basically making a, a motif out of it. Right. Uh, I use it in rings, earrings, and uh, this is just one element mm -hmm. of it. I'll be showing this in Washington D.C. for our, uh, upcoming. Uh, Muscogee Creek, Creek Nation, Nation Days, days. Oh, in great. Washington, D.C. Great. <laughs> and these are examples of uh, uh, dime bead necklaces uh, among Seminoles. They use uh, dime bead necklaces uh, when wearing traditional outfit. And with your stamping. So yeah, you so I stamp each dime. Uh, I leave the original date. So these are all early 1906, 1907s. These are 1930s and 40s bead necklaces. Uh, what distinguishes my work from, uh, uh, I think, some of the classic old work is I use uh, high-end turquoise. Mm -hmm. This is a, a castle dome turquoise. I use high-quality coral. Uh, well, a lot of times these are done in uh, glass beads. Right. Which are awesome, you know, but they, like I said, sometimes yeah, I like to go it's finer. It's beautiful, the contrast between the dimes and the, the shell, the turquoise and the, yeah. Oh, they're fantastic. Well, um, thank you so much for your time today, Kenneth. Sure.